Heavenly Father, we we are sometimes overtaken by the glory of Christ as we should be. And we just pray that you would help us to live in a way worthy of that glory. We never will, but help us to live to a greater degree worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Help us today as we approach the solemn and weighty proclamation of your word that we would listen with attentive hearts, retentive hearts that would retain what we can glean from Your Word today. Hearts that would apply Your Word to our lives as we go about our lives and we leave this place. We pray that You would do Your work and that we would continue growing in the likeness of Christ, which is Your purpose for each and every one of us. And for those who don't know You, that today would be the day of salvation where they see the glory of Christ and bend the knee before Him. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to John chapter 12. This will be the last passage in John. We're going to be looking at verses 44 through 50. And there's an importance that's given to last words. If you look up, if you Google last words of famous people, there's lots of last words that you can, you can see. People give a lot of importance to last words because when people are going to die, when they're about to exit this world, they want the last thing that they say to be important, to be significant. They know that it's going to have an importance just because it's the last address. And this passage that we are going to look at today is not the final words of Christ before His death, but it is the final address to the crowd. It is His final appeal to the multitude that has been rejecting Him all this time. He cries out publicly one last time. So these are the words that He wants to ring in their ears as the cross is approaching. It's His last sermon. And as we look at this passage, you're going to see that most of, almost everything that we see here has been covered before in the Gospel of John. And most of the commentaries that I read, they don't, adri- they don't spend a lot of time on this passage because these concepts and these truths have already been addressed in their commentaries. The context leading up to our passage, which is important to understand the meaning of it, what we've seen in chapter 12 so far is that this was after the triumphal entry. Some Greeks were looking for our Lord Jesus, and that prompted a whole series. He launched off into a discourse when when he realized that they were looking for him. And he talks first of his anguish. He calls out to the Father. The Father responds audibly to him. Verses 27 and 28. Then he talks about the victory of the cross, judging the world and casting out Satan. And then we see the response of unbelief rebuked by our Lord and a commentary by John on their predicted unbelief and hardened state from the book of Isaiah. What we're going to see today is that in this discourse, the Savior calls us to embrace the truth so that we may live eternally. It's a last call to them and to us to embrace the truth. Like I said, we'll be looking at verses 44 through 50 of this 12th chapter of the Gospel of John. And I'm going to divide that into two main points. The person of Christ in verses 44 through 46 and the words of Christ in verses 47 through 50. Before we get into it, let's go ahead and give reading to this passage. John 12, 44 through 50. 
And Jesus cried out and said, Whoever believes in Me, believes not in Me, but in Him who sent Me. And whoever sees Me, sees Him who sent Me. I have come into the world as light, so that whoever believes in Me may not remain in darkness. If anyone hears the words, My words, and does not keep them, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. So our first point is the person of Christ. And it starts in verse 44, where it says, And Jesus cried out. Jesus cried out. Before we get into this text, I just have to mention that there's two ways of seeing the text here. Some scholars believe that this text is a commentary given by John, the Gospel writer, in which he summarizes the teaching of Christ. The other way to see it is that this is Jesus addressing the crowd for the last time. Now, why, why would they see it in this way? Well, because in verse 36, if you look back there, The second part of verse 36 says, When Jesus had said these things, He departed and hid Himself from them. So how is it that now Jesus is addressing the crowd? I guess that's a problem for some scholars, and that's why they think this is a summary. But I agree with Ryle when he says that the fact that it says, and Jesus cried out and said, indicates not that this is a summary of Jesus' teaching, but He's addressing them on some other occasion for the last time. Notice it says that Jesus cried out. He cried out. It it doesn't say that He said. It says that He cried out. He exclaimed. There was a multitude there and He passionately cried out to them to believe His message. It was a passionate appeal. You have to, when you read this, you have to hear the urgency in there, the compassion and mercy of Christ at seeing these hardened people that have rejected him time and time again. And he sees that their only hope, the only hope for their salvation is if they listen to him and embrace him and his message. Think about it. God himself, the creator, the sustainer, the one who was upholding their lives at that very moment is calling out to these same people, pleading with them, urging them to believe. What condescension. What humility. It's it's really amazing. Should there be passion in, in our preaching? Should there be emotion in our preaching? If we're going to follow the steps of Christ, there's going to be emotion. The preaching of Jesus, the preaching of John the Baptist, the preaching of all the prophets was with passion. With passion and compassion. Yes. With emotion. Should there be emotion in your spiritual life? Yes. Yes. There should be. There should be emotion. I hope you experience emotions in your spiritual life. We spoke about this a little bit on Wednesday. Jesus wants your intellect, your will, and your affections. Your emotions. Thank you. Our Christianity, authentic Christianity, is holistic. Hear me. Authentic Christianity involves the intellect, the will, 
and the emotions. If you're involved in some kind of Christian experience that involves only the intellect, be careful. If you're involved in some kind of Christian experience that involves only the emotions, be careful. Because true Christianity involves the whole person. It involves the whole person. Lopsided Christianity is dangerous if it's Christianity at all. Because we can easily be fooled. Christ wants all of you. And what happens is, many times in Christianity, we have knee-jerk reactions. Oh, this, this Christianity is emotionalism, so then we don't want to have any emotions. Or this Christianity is a dry orthodoxy, so doctrine is bad. No. We should be holistic, wholly belonging to Christ. A true Christian is a studying Christian that exercises his intellect to understand the truths of the Bible. So that the doctrinal statement that he affirms is not just something he affirms, but he can defend with Scripture. A true Christian is a decided Christian. His will is decided for Christ. He made a decision a long time ago that has made hundreds and thousands of decisions for him ever since. He's decided to follow Christ. A true Christian is a passionate Christian. We're not talking about concocted emotions. We're not talking about artificial emotions. We're talking from emotions that come from the truth. Natural, not forced. We're talking about a person where the emotions are not in the driver's seat. The will and the intellect are driving the car. You know, you should be moved by the truth. You should be moved by the truth. The truth should move you. If you're a purely intellectual Christian, you're going to be somewhat stoic, somewhat hard. The truth of God should move you. The songs that we sing should move you. When the truth is preached, it should move you. You can say amen. That's fine here. You can say amen to that. You should be at some times moved to tears by your sin. If you see your sin as God sees it even a little bit, there's times in your life, this might not happen all the time, but there's times in your life that your sin will move you to tears. The love of Christ that we see in the Scriptures should move you to love Him more. Jesus was not stoic. We've already seen, even in the Gospel of John, that Jesus was not a stoic. He was an emotional man. He wasn't an ex extremely emotional man, but he was moved to tears, wasn't he? He was compassionate. He felt pity. Spiritual realities moved him, and we should get to the point where we are moved as well. If we are a vibrant and healthy Christian, we will be moved by the truth. But what does Jesus say? Let's continue. He says, Whoever believes in Me believes not in Me, but in Him who sent Me. Believing in Christ is not just believing in Him. It's not believing in Jesus only. Believing in Christ is believing in the Father. We see that, or we saw that already in John chapter 6, verse 28 and 29. Then, he, then they said to him, What must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in Him whom He has sent. The work of God is believing in Him who He sent, the Lord Jesus Christ. This speaks of the unity between Christ and the Father. They're inseparable. They're inseparable. There's no jealousy in the Trinity. I could sit up here and talk about Jesus Christ all day long. The Father doesn't get jealous. I'm not making less of the Father because the Father's glorified in the Son. And when I glorify the Son, I am glorifying the Father. Another point that this means is that you cannot believe in God without believing in Christ. You can't have God 
without Christ. See, that's what they wanted to do. They were rejecting Christ, but they all, all would say that they believed in God. But we can't make this fight false dichotomy. He is the way. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through Him. That's why people don't want to believe in Christ. They're fine with God. Talk about God. Don't talk about Christ. Christ is exclusive. He shuts out all other religions. And we don't like that because we want to think that, well, if people are sincere, they're going to heaven. The way to the Father is through the Son. There's no salvation outside of Him. You know, we need to, to take note of that because sometimes it's easier just to talk about God and not about Christ. But we can't let the world have God without Christ. We need to be naming the, the name of Christ. We need to be talking about our Lord Jesus Christ and speaking His name. Verse 45 continues, And whoever sees Me sees Him who sent Me. I'll turn back to read chapter 1, verse 18. It says, No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side, He has made Him known. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side, He has made Him known. Jesus is the manifestation of the Father. This talks about His deity. No prophet, no apostle, no evangelist could ever say, if you've seen Me, you've seen God. That would be blasphemy. Only our Lord Jesus Christ could say that. And the verb that's used here, the verb that's used here for see, isn't just to perceive with the eyes. It's to behold. It's to contemplate. Talking about an intinu a continuous gazing and beholding and appreciating of the object. So anyone that has seen Christ, many people saw Christ, and he says, if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. But the apostles, the disciples that had beheld Christ, they had seen the Father in a different way. We see something very similar to this. John 14, verses 6 through 9. You turn ahead a couple pages. John 14. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know Him and you have seen Him. Philip said to Him, Lord, show us the Father and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long and you still do not know Me, Philip? Whoever has seen Me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Beholding Christ is beholding the Father. And so we have to ask ourselves, have I beheld Christ? Have I seen the glory of Christ? Or is He some Sunday school story that's covered in dust and is so far removed? Is Christ a reality to me? Have I seen Him? Have I seen His glory? Have I been captivated by Him? Have I seen the treasure in the field and sold everything that I have to get that possession. Is that how precious He is to me? Is He my delight? We continue in verse 46. I have come into the world as light so that whoever believes in Me may not remain in darkness. I have come into the world. The tense there that it uses in the Greek is the perfect tense, which means something that happened and has abiding results. He didn't say, I came into the world. He says, I have come into the world because nothing is ever going to be the same after the Incarnation. We don't go back to the Old Testament. Once Christ came, everything changed. Everything is different. 
And what's he talking about this darkness? We know that we are born into darkness. Darkness is in our DNA for crying out loud. Darkness refers to ignorance. It refers to condemnation and sin as well. We have no light, no true spiritual knowledge. We can know things about this world, but we have no true spiritual knowledge, no knowledge of how God really is and how we really are in relation to Him and what this life is about until we come to Christ. His purpose in coming was to call us out of darkness, out of slavery to sin, slavery to Satan, ignorance, being under His wrath. And so we have two options. Reject Him and remain in darkness or believe in Him and step into the light. Now, you may be here and say, well, I'm a believer. I have stepped into the light. But we still have a tendency to darkness. We still need our minds to be renewed. So my question is, how much light is in your life right now? How much light are you getting from the Scripture? How much time are you spending in the Scripture to receive the light of the truth? How much light is in your daily interactions? Do you have time throughout the week where you're in contact with other believers, where you have spiritual conversations, where you're being pointed to Christ, where you're reminding yourselves of the truth of His Word? That's light. Do you pray with others? That's light. How much light is in your life? How much light are you exposing yourself to? Because we need our thinking to be renewed so that we're thinking God's thoughts and not our own. So Christ is calling here. He's calling them to faith. And the first thing He's talked about is His person. But now in the next verses, in 47 through 50, He's going to talk about his words. I've said this before, but when Christ would teach, when he was speaking to the people in the first century in Palestine, when he opened his mouth, what came out was the words of God. It was the word of God coming out of his mouth. If anyone hears, my words. You know, His words are not like ours. Our words are just sound, air, sound waves. There's no power to our words. They just express our thoughts, our intentions. The words of God are different. The words of God called the universe into existence. They're powerful. The words of Jesus specifically directed nature. Expelled disease, bound evil spirits, called life back into dead bodies. The Word of God is not like our words. And he says, if anyone hears my words and does not keep them. What does that mean? That we keep his words. We carry his words with us. Keeping the words is just doesn't refer to guarding them or holding on to them. It refers to obeying them, observing His words, applying His words. And I want you to notice that there's always a link. We've seen a link in Scripture, in, the, in John, but in all of Scripture there's a link between belief and obedience. We don't see that there's a belief without obedience. How do we know that we believe? We obey. If we keep His words... It's synonymous with believing His words. You know, there's only one kind of being that under certain circumstances has a choice of heeding the words of God, and that's humanity. Think about it. When God speaks to angels, they obey. When God speaks to demons, they obey. When He talks to nature, it obeys. And when He talks to humanity, sometimes we obey. That's a, a scary thought, isn't it? God has given us the option to obey, 
But along with the option to obey or disobey, there's consequences. He continues saying, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. We see a very similar verse in chapter 3, verse 17. See that same idea. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The first coming was to save. The second coming will be to judge. Jesus didn't come to judge. The second coming will be to judge. We can see that if we go back to John 5, verse 22. John chapter 5, verse 22 says, The Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son. So the Son is going to judge, but He's saying not at this time. Look at verses 27 through 30. And He has given Him authority to execute judgment because He is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear His voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. So there is a time when Christ will judge. But He's saying right now, He's urging them to believe the Gospel. He's not there to judge them. He's there to offer salvation. His invitation is to believe. His desire is that we would believe in Him. He came to bring salvation, not condemnation, but look at verse 48. The one who rejects Me and does not receive My words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. He didn't come to judge, but if we don't heed His appeal to believe and we reject Him, there's a consequence of judgment. The message of Christ can be ignored, but it comes with a cost. Our soul. His words carry divine authority throughout the ages. And on the day of judgment, those who have heard the Gospel message, those who have heard the message of Christ and rejected it, those words will be a witness against them. Those words will call for condemnation. And why do the words of Christ carry such Authority. Well, we see it in verses 49 and 50. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who has sent me has Himself given a commandment, what to say and what to speak. And I know that His commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. The commandment of the Father is life. The commandment of the Father results in life. And that is what Jesus is speaking. It's not like His Word is different from the Father's. It's one and the same. This isn't saying that Jesus is saying, well, I'm just an ambassador from the Father. He's saying, we're one. We're one and the same. You can't reject Me and have Him because we're one and the same. If the commandment of the Father is life, rejecting that message is death. The message of Christ is weighty because eternal life and death lie in our response to Christ and His message. Jesus is still crying out. When anyone reads the Scripture, when anyone hears the Gospel proclaimed, Jesus is still calling out that people would believe that they would come out of the darkness and embrace the truth. Notice in our passage, belief, obedience, and embracing and beholding the Savior leads to life. Belief, obedience, and embracing and beholding the Savior leads to life. Rejecting the message is rejecting Christ and leads to condemnation and death. This passage is, is an evangelistic passage. So you say, well, but I'm a believer. Where am I in all this? What importance does this have to me? 
Well, Jesus proclaimed the message and He passed on the baton to the disciples who would then be the apostles, right? And to all who would believe in Him. He sought to save the lost, to communicate the message of salvation, and to implore people to come to Christ. And He passed that baton onto us. So the question is, how well are we doing in proclaiming that message? Are we allowing to Christ to call out, to cry out as it were through us? Through our lives that are consistent with the Gospel? Through our words when we get an opportunity to point someone to Christ? How are we part of this? How are we part of this reaching others? May we be a light and be a witness so that through us, Christ would continue to be heard and continue crying out to the lost. Let's pray. Lord, it's so easy. It's so easy for me to be settled in my comfort zone, in my comfortable Christianity. I come here to church with a lot of friendly people. I read your Bible, but there's aspects of Christianity that are not as comfortable. Being equipped and ready and willing to share the truth with others. Being looking for opportunities. Living a life that would even proclaim the Gospel. That would not deny a Gospel that I would share with my lips, but that it would back it up. I know I need to grow in this aspect and I know we all want to grow and want to be better instruments for the proclamation of Your Word, for the edifying of believers, and for the furthering of Your Kingdom. We thank You for this Scripture and we pray that You would use it in our lives and that we would, as a church, become more and more of a shining beacon of truth here in Laredo in all the and take all the opportunities that You give us to proclaim Your Word. In Your precious name we pray. Amen.